Hello everyone movie recap here. Today we are going to recap 300. King Leonidas and 300 Spartans confronted Xerxes and his vast Persian army in the historic battle of Thermopylae. When a Spartan reject betrays them, they are up against impossible odds. Spoilers ahead. The opening narration of 300 explains how Spartan youngsters develop into true Spartan men. When the child is delivered, a Spartan baby inspector carefully examines him over a precipice where hundreds of feet below are the bones of dead infants who did not pass the test. The infant will be put to death if he exhibits any signs of weakness, illness, or other issues. The boys begin fighting and training at a young age, and when they turn seven, they are taken away from their mothers to undergo an initiation of rites before they can return home. This initiation of rites includes being whipped without showing emotion and being left outside in the cold and snow to fend for themselves. When a Persian messenger rides through Sparta and requests to speak with King Leonidas, daily life is still going on there. The skulls of several recently deceased presidents are in his hands. Xerxes, the Persian god, king who has previously destroyed thousands of cities, including other Greek cities like Athens, wants the people of Sparta to submit to him, the messenger and his guards explain as they are escorted before the king. When the messenger confronts Queen Gorgo about her remark, she responds, Spartan women are the ones who give birth to real men, when he gets agitated and questions how a lady can talk like that among men. King Leonidas turns on the messenger and points his spear in his face, forcing the Persian to retreat to the edge of the dark abyss you saw in the teaser after warning him to think carefully before answering Xerxes' questions about Sparta. This is blasphemy, the messenger cries, and you cannot kill a messenger. Leonidas roars back, this is Sparta, and then he pushes the Persian and his guards into the pit. Even if the king of Sparta wants to go to war, he is required by law to consult the oracle and the ephors, who are the gods' priests and who are more creature than man, before doing so. The oracle is the most attractive young woman in Sparta, but her beauty is also her misfortune because she is compelled to live in the mountains with the ugly ephors, who are sometimes inebriated or high on drugs, in order to be able to predict these realities or destinies. After climbing the highlands and offering the ephors some gold and detailing his intention to proceed north and encircle Xerxes's army, Leonidas asks the oracle what it has to say. He cannot go to fight when a festival is about to take place, according to the ephors. The king is frustrated because he cannot do anything but sit still. Theron, one of the councilmen, is seen in the next scenario bribing the ephors with gold from the Persians in recompense for advising the king that he cannot declare war. The king and queen do not trust Theron, as is evident from earlier scenes, and this is understandable given that he turns out to be a Spartan traitor. Leonidas and his captain are examining his 300-person army the following morning. The king observes that the captain's son is too young and hasn't really experienced the warmth of a woman, after noticing that one of the men is the captain's son, but the captain insists that he fight. The sons seem to be proud to be among these incredibly powerful fighters. Theron and the other council members approach the king and inquire about his activities. Theron asserts that the oracle has spoken and that he is aware of the law and the rules. The king claims that he is only taking a stroll and that these 300 guys are merely his bodyguards. The king responds in the north when Theron cynically asks where he'll be walking to. Too hot gate or was it hell gate? Theron responds. From the water come the Persians. The king and his 300 Spartans will be there. The queen gives Leonidas her necklace before they leave and instructs him to come back with his shield or on it. They encounter the Arcadians as they march by another group. The Arcadian chieftain claims that they are coming to join Sparta in its battle with Xerxes after hearing about it. He is however taken aback by the king's lack of accompanying men. You can see the Spartans' haughtiness and arrogance in this situation. One of the Arcadia-born troops is questioned by Leonidas about his occupation. He responded, a sculptor. Blacksmith was another person, one more potter. Leonidas asks or roars as he turns to face his 300-man army, what was your profession? The king informs the Arcadians that he has more soldiers than you have, in response to their thunderous ho, which they primarily shout after becoming fired up. Everyone marches down to the ocean together after the Arcadians express their admiration. The queen wishes to speak with the council members in the meantime to request their support in sending an army to fight alongside Leonidas against the Persian army. One of the councilmen she has sought to call the meeting says she will be able to speak in two days. The king might not have two days, according to her. The Arcadians begin to doubt themselves when they reach the beach area and notice how many Persian boats are in the water. 
The Arcadians are initially thrilled when the Greek gods send a powerful storm to flip some of those boats over and destroy them, but when dawn comes, it appears that the quantity of boats has not decreased. The other Spartan men are content since they can only anticipate finding their equal, someone who can offer them a reason to die, beautifully. They desire to pass away in defense of their nation. Someone from Xerxes' army approaches as they are erecting a stone wall and demands that Sparta bow on its knees once more. If they lay down their weapons and look to him as the leader, Xerxes, who admires their haughtiness and might, would make Sparta the richest city and would leave the city's women and children alone. Before realizing that between those stones are the dead remains of several soldiers from the Persian army who were in charge of keeping watch, the messenger makes fun of the stone wall the Spartans are erecting. The messenger is ordered to inform Xerxes that the battle has begun by one of the Spartans, who then amputates his arm. Some of the Spartans detect that someone is following them as this is happening. It turns out to be Ephialtes, a monster with a hunched back who wants to assist in the battle. He informs the king that the Persians can enter through a different gap. He makes a powerful spear thrust but is unable to lift his bulky shield. The king argues that he cannot engage in combat with the Spartans since they use their shields to protect not only themselves but also the guy to their left, rendering Ephialtes useless because he is unable to raise his shield. Ephialtes becomes quite angry. The strength of the Spartans is evident in the opening conflict. They wait in the small opening as the first Persian army formation emerges to engage in combat. They destroyed everyone in that army and suffered no casualties. The rest of the Persian army fires so many arrows that they completely hide from the sun while they catch their breath. Together, the Spartans block the arrows with their shields and denounce the attackers as cowards. Xerxes emerges to meet with Leonidas while both sides pause to recover and clear the battlefield. The unidentifiable Rodrigo Santoro plays the seven-foot-tall, bald, and pierced god, king known as Xerxes. Once more, he offers Leonidas the choice to submit to him, but the king declines since his thighs are still painful from defeating the first Persian army. Infuriated, Xerxes declares that he can destroy Sparta and ensure that no one on earth ever learns of them or recognizes them. Everyone will quickly forget who King Leonidas and the Spartans are because he will cut out the mouths and eyes of anybody who ever mentions them. The immortals will be the next foe in the conflict. Their teeth are filed into fangs, and they are soulless monsters with dark eyes. They have masks made of black and gold, and this enormous chained monster is their particular weapon. Even though they lost some of their soldiers, the Spartans easily beat these adversaries. The narrator claims that this godlike deity has a human chill up his spine as Xerxes looks on. The Persians engage in the subsequent battles with as much force as they are able to muster, employing monsters, magic, elephants from halfway across the world, and rhinoceroses. Xerxes disciplines his generals by chopping off their heads when he sees the army losing. The captain's son loses his head in one of these clashes, and he sobs in agony as his heart is torn apart. Three men are required to remove him from his son. King Leonidas calls out to one of his troops, Dilios, who was hurt during one of the fights, as both sides retreat once more. When he inquires about Dilios, he responds, it's just an eye. The king orders him to go back to his home and inform everyone in Greece about Sparta and his 300 men. Even though he is upset that he won't see his wife again, he is glad to be working for Sparta even though he knows they are going to perish. He hands Dilios the necklace his wife gave him so he can give it back to her. Theron is meeting with the queen in the interim. He inquires as to whether it is poison as she offers him something to drink. He implies that if she sleeps with him, he can convince the councilman to authorize an army to go to the king despite their adamant refusal to do so. When she consents, he roughly begins having sex with her and warns her that, this will not be over quickly. You won't like it. Not your king am I. To Xerxes, Ephialtes has gone. There are belly dancers, concubines, contortionists, transsexuals, slaves, and other performers in the tent. He is in awe of all that Xerxes has to offer, wealth, ladies, and the chance to engage in combat if he will only submit to him. Awestruck by everything, Ephialtes concurs and informs him of the second opportunity where the Persian army can easily defeat the Spartans. The council members and the queen meet the following day. She makes a powerful argument for allowing the soldiers to go and support the king. Some of the group members are clearly moved by what she is saying and are beginning to concur with her. She finishes her speech, and Theron mock applauds her. She is an adulterer, he claims, so why should anyone pay attention to her? He claims that she approached him and offered herself to him, but that because he is an honest man, he rejected her. 
She becomes angry and attempts to follow him, but he commands two guards to seize her and drag her from the room. Since she is the queen, they release her despite her fight. Once she is free, she takes one of their swords and stabs Theron in the abdomen. This won't be over quickly, she adds as she draws him in and drives the sword farther deeper. You won't like it. Not your queen am I. His money pouch also comes loose when she draws the blade, and as he tumbles to the ground, the Persian coins used to bribe him do as well. The other councilmen pick up one of the coins, recognize the man as a traitor, and speak out against him. It's just the king and what's left of his army as the Arcadians disperse from camp. Everyone is in the vicinity of the Persian army. Once more, as Xerxes watches, one of his henchmen orders Leonidas to kneel before Xerxes. But this time, Leonidas genuinely removes his helmet, sets down his shield and spear, and prostrates himself. Only to regain his composure when his huddled Spartan troops break away and one of them charges up and hops onto Leonidas back to spear that slave to death. The king throws his spear, which slashes through Xerxes' cheek but spares him death, while everyone recommences fighting. Surprised, Xerxes puts his palm to his bloodied face. The Spartans start to fall one by one, even the king. One of them says to him, it is an honor to die at your side. The king responds, it was an honor to live at your side. The rest of the Persian army kills him after he turns to face the sun and utters his final words, my love, and they then reshoot an enormous number of arrows into the air to ensure that all the Spartans are dead. When Dilios gets home, he tells everyone about their victory and gives the jewelry to the queen. After a year, Dilios appears to be in charge of the Spartan army, and they are preparing to engage the Persians once more. However, this time there are countless numbers of Spartans, and when ordered, they charge into battle. We really hope you enjoyed today's recap of 300. Please leave a comment below on what you loved about the movie and why. Be sure to like the video and please don't forget to support our channel by subscribing so you don't miss any amazing content. Until next time, lights, camera, action. We look forward to seeing you in our next video.